there's very little about the journey to get into tech that looks like a tech lifestyle. Just, just, it's just not fun. Nobody's Instagramming it. Nobody's putting it on YouTube. The red eyes, frustration. And I realize you're not in that old environment. That above and beyond just salary means the world to be an adult and to be treated like an adult, to be treated with trust first. So sometimes there's behaviors that are happening that we call imposter syndrome that are not. Lawrence Lockhart works in the hospitality business for over 16, if not 18 years. And at the age of 44 years old is when he decided to learn how to code. Not only that, he persistently studied code for two years and did not get his first job in tech until he became 46 years old. Lawrence, who is now well into his 50s, has such an amazing story to share with y'all. Out of all the podcast episodes I've had thus far in the history of this channel, I think this is by far the most important interview that I've ever had. Why? Because how many people in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s and up think that it's not possible? How many people think that they can't become a software engineer because they're way too late? Lawrence will prove you wrong. I hope you all enjoy this one. I'm looking forward to it too. Let's get into this. Yo, Lawrence, seriously, I am so happy to have you on here. Man, you, how am I even here right now? How what are you am talking I on about? the Real Chris Sean podcast? Dude, Dude, no. Before we get to any of your questions, do you understand the impact that you have made on me and so oh, many dude. others? Yo. Chris, I've been in tech for five years now. I started seven years ago learning. At that time, when I would go to YouTube, there was a very small number of people I got inspiration from. You, shout out to you, Joe Santos Garcia, a.k.a. Of AKA Your brother. Cody Faze. <laughs> Uh, a guy called Jimmy a geek who used to review like Udacity courses, things like that. And for some reason, I got a lot of inspiration from Lewis Rossman, the guy in New York who fixes iPhones when he's not supposed to. But he just had like this grit mentality, like, you know, screw the system. I'm going to fix these. You were the four. And I would watch you for yeah. inspiration and seeing your journey and you being so open. So thank you for talking about your journey, which you went through the highs and the lows. It means a lot because, uh, you know, it's hard to sometimes believe something you can't see. It's hard, but when you have that tangible evidence, people like yourself and Joe and others, you know, it's like, hey, if they can, I, I can do it too. I can do it. Let me keep pressing along. So I appreciate you, man. No, dude, and to be I, here now, I this is like full circle. Kind of this is full circle. It, it, it's amazing, man. I mean, just looking back from seven years ago when Joe and I started our YouTube channels, like Joe's success. Yeah. Damn, he's killing it, right? And so I'm Absolutely. so happy for him. And, and to see, you know, and to be honest, like you make all this content. And I remember when I started my YouTube channel, I was only getting like a thousand, two thousand views per video, and thinking oh, yeah, this, is, this isn't this helping a lot of people. This isn't helping a lot of people. I should stop. But I kept going because this is always my hobby, right? It's just my hobby, and it turned sure. into my passion. And now it's <laughs> I haven't shared this yet, but now my full time income. <laughs> but oh, really? Yeah, yeah, oh. so, yeah. So I'll talk about it in a second. You released information. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I I'm so happy to have you on here too, though. And by the way, thank you for those kind words because. You became a dev in your 40s. Yes. Okay. Like, and yes. I, I want to emphasize how amazing that is because, okay, I was a dev at 27. I was an engineer for four or five years. I was in dev for three years, but I barely coded for three years. I'm not as technical as I used to be. So I, I kind of, and it's not, and I don't blame my jobs, but I also blame that the roles I took weren't as technical. Mm-hmm. Only, only content, if that makes sense. And that hurt right, me. Right. And so, and so. Now that I, <laughs> I guess, now that I'm no longer in DevRel, right? I'm no longer working right now in tech. Um, sometimes I wonder, can I still make it back into the engineering role? And then when I think, and I, then when I think of that, I think of you. I'm like, yeah, damn, dude, Lawrence became a dev at 40. I still have four years under my belt as an engineer, right? I'm out of the seven years. I can, I can go back into engineering if I want to, if I want to go back to a nine to five. And so, like. You're, so what I'm trying to say is that what you've been able to accomplish is so amazing because by the yeah, time you're 40, you. you already have a family, right? You had a family already? Please oh, correct yes. me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you had, oh, right. yes. Okay. yes. Second wife, I mean. Yeah. Oh, yes. so, what's, damn, okay. Okay, so by the time you got a job as a dev, how old was your oldest child? Oh, gosh, you're taking me back now. So that's seven years ago. So we're talking 19. Yeah, wow. 14. 
So you raised a, an adult. <laughs> you raised you raised an adult by the time you became a dev. And why do Absolutely. I want to bring this up? Because there are so many people who are trying to get in tech, even now, who feel like there's no hope because they, you know, they either chose the wrong path or didn't have the correct guidance or didn't even know about tech, right? Um, and so thank you for being on here because I really believe that this will encourage a lot of people. Man, and so it. for people who don't know you, You've been in tech for the last, you said five years, right? Five years, six five years. years total, yep. You were a software engineer. You were at, um, I believe, even FedEx as a software engineer or senior software engineer? As a software developer, mid-level. Yep. Mid-level for four years, though, at FedEx, four which is years. impressive, right? And now you're in DevRel. So, by the way, congratulations on that. Um, Good luck. <laughs> good luck. Well, strategic. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and, you know, DevRel, for people who don't know, you were already kind of doing DevRel before DevRel. You were a little bit. You're doing content here and there, and you're yeah. doing it for fun. Which is so amazing because you wanted to help people. Correct me if I'm wrong. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. It's, I mean, I get literally more joy in helping developers win than I do writing individual lines of code. And so once I found out that there's a job where you actually do that and you get paid for it, I'm like, oh, I'm all in. I'm all in. And then I uh, did a couple other strategic things that I'm sure we'll get into later. But yeah, I was always in the community, always involved like that from the very beginning. And, um, you know, you mean mentioning, you know, starting at 46. So my first job, I worked at Fred's, a little place called Fred's Dollar Store, a little convenience chain throughout the South. They went back. So this, this is your life before tech, right? This is your life before tech. No, this was the first tech jobs, right? Before oh, FedEx, I was at Fred's. Damn, okay. But um, the thing about Fred's, like I said, starting at 46, I had some excellent examples in my parents. So my dad was a mechanical engineer, but he didn't get his degree until much later in life. I think like 30s or 40s. My mom was in education. She was a school teacher. She didn't get her bachelor's until her 50s. So I had examples right in front of me that age doesn't matter. The question is, are you willing to put in the work? And that's the thing that I, when I deal with so many mentees, I deal with so many people who are going through different stages. I'm dealing with this and with that. The question is, are you willing to put in the work? Because when they ask me about things like, well, how did you balance when you were learning to code? Like, how did you balance? Fam I said, there was no balance. You're not, you're not understanding this. I'm going up a mountain to be a full adult with a full family and a mortgage and cars and a job in the restaurant business of all things. I was in the restaurant business, hospitality manager, 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks, 80 hour week. I'm the GM. And barely still GM. making so, ends meet. Could I say? Oh yeah. Why well, the money was great. I just had oh. no life. I had no <laughs> life. And so when people ask, how did I balance? There was no balance. I would be up all day at, at, the, at the job, say from eight in the morning till six, seven in the evening, come home a little bit of time with family and then up all night, sometimes even doing all nighters just to learn to code. Because I didn't want it to take like 10 years or five years or four years. It still took me two years and three months for some other reasons, but I wanted to kind of escalate the process. So there was no balance. But the point being, I was willing to put in the work. Even after I quit because JavaScript, JavaScript kicked my butt, then I think Python kicked my butt and something else and I would quit and come back, I was still willing to put in the work. And that's the only critical factor, not what your background is, what your age is. Whenever you decide, I'm going to do this, I've got plenty of examples of other people who have done it. Let me put in the work. Let me put in the time. Let me get my 10,000 hours in or whatever it is. And you, it, can, it can happen. It can happen for anybody. It definitely can. I mean, you're a perfect example of that. Now, before you even dive into tech, I want to talk about your life before your 40s. Well, you became a dev in your 40s, right? So before oh, tech. 46, yeah. Right? At 46. That's not even... Damn, that's the later... Ha, ha, you're, you're in your 50s? I'm 51. I look good. I know. Dude, I, I know. thought you were like 37, 38. I know. Bro, I, look good. I mean, hey, I've, been, I've been working out too, okay? I've been working out hey, too, okay? I've been seeing you. I've been seeing you. I've been seeing you. I've been seeing you. Yo, yo. Um... You got to keep the temple around, man. This is important. All the systems are important. You got to take care of this. Gotta More than money, dude. Like I can make 300, 400K a year, but if I'm not going to make it till my 70s, 80s, or 90s. What's the point? What's the point, right? Exactly. Um, 100%. So, damn, hold on. 46, you became the dev. All right. So, yep. so I started learning when I was 44. 44. Yep. And I was working in the restaurant business for 17 well, at that point, 15 years, so additional to, but yeah, 15 years restaurant business that to, at that point. Because when I screwed up in college, back when I was probably a little bit younger than you, see, I was always supposed to be in tech. Let's just go all the way back. I was always supposed to be in tech. Went to a top-notch university and just bombed out. Just failed. Miserably. Horribly. Kicked out. Expelled after three semesters. 
And it had such an impact on my mental that even when I went to like a little community college and little state colleges around town, I couldn't even pass those. Four and a half years, Chris, struggled trying to get that degree. Because that was the plan. Like I was this big, big high school phenom, the math and science guy, all the science awards and the math club president. And I was all of that and went to college and just screwed it up. And after like four and a half years, my dad was like, you know, I don't know what the impediment is between you and this degree, but you're grown now. You need a job. And that's how I slipped into the restaurant business, because it's just one of those industries when you have no marketable skills, it's either hospitality, retail or warehouse, at least down here in the South it is. And you just kind of figure it out. I was never like this big food guy, but I had to make money. I had to live. And my dad was insistent on, you know, I have to grow up as a man, learn to take care of responsibilities. So I slipped into the restaurant business, fooled myself into liking it for a number of years, got out for a brief point. There was like five years in supply chain. I worked at a Nissan plant, which is a car plant down here in Kent, Mississippi. That didn't last long. Back to restaurants again. After I swore no more restaurants, I was back in restaurants again of every type. And um, it's a lot of hours, a lot of hours. And the money was okay, again. So when I came, when I went from restaurant to tech, I actually took a drop down in pay because I was doing all right. Drop down in pay? How much were you making yeah. in the restaurant business compared to your first tech? Well, I will tell you that, but I won't share any more because of yeah. the way things work when you're black and you share salary. But mm. um, in the restaurant business, I was at 75 when I left my left job. 75K, um, that would have been seven, no, five years ago. So I took a drop down, but I did it because I knew this was the foot in the door to lead me on the path to like no limit, like no limit in salary, like you, any number you can come up with. Fun fact, um, one of my OG mentors, uh, Scott Hanselman, he was posting about his level. He's an L70 at Microsoft. I was like, hmm, I wonder. So I went to Levels FYI, because that's what you do. And, you know, L70 is where they run out of data. <laughs> but if you go, like, a level before that or so, mm -hmm. it's it's a very, very Did high Did you say L70? 70? 70? L70, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's and way And I'm here, here, like, trying to get, like, an L5, L6 roll. That's impressive. <laughs> Okay, so I think yeah, that's the right number. I have to look it up again, but whatever it is, there was no data available. Like no one's reported their salary that I. So uh, the point being, this was my foot in the door to to unlimited, not just income, but to actually having a life again, to be able to see my kids grow up, to be there for the good times, the bad times. Not oh, dad has to miss this one. Sorry, because that that sucks. That sucks to not be there. There's an event. There's something going on at school. Oh, dad has to work. Oh, okay. I remember sometimes, even when I started learning to code, like getting off late, late. So I work Saturday evening. I was in a college town, Oxford, Mississippi, Ole Miss, working all Saturday night, busy college day, getting off Sunday morning, and then trying to figure out, like, I'm, I have had no sleep. Should I go to sleep or go to church? Like, what kind of a decision is that? No one should have to decide that, regardless of your religious background. No one should have to decide, should I sleep or go praise the Lord? Like, that's that's just wrong. And I would make the strategic choice sometimes, like, I just won't sleep today. Well, that's not good on my body. That's not good on my health. Who, what good am I to anybody just skipping sleep for an entire day and then going back to work the next day? So I knew I had to make a change. And it wasn't a thing of, I need to make a change or, hmm, tech seems neat to me. Because I run into a lot of that these days. People who think, like, tech is neat. Maybe I'll try some tech. This was a thing I had to change my life. When it goes from a need to, to a must, to a have to, you operate differently. You're willing to go harder, study longer, network more. You're willing to do all the things, even if they're not, even if they're a little uncomfortable. So that transition into tech, that, that decision to make that transition to tech started with the fact that no work-life balance and you're, you're, you're working when everyone's home, night, evening shifts, after evening shifts, sometimes seven days a week. Right. Physical labor. And by the time you get home, you're exhausted. Yeah. The seven days a week. That's the thing, too, because he, as a GM, if you're working six days, you still can't rest on the seventh day because you're in charge. If something goes wrong at the store, if the, you know, the, the grill catches on fire, so the you know, manager walks out, you're still on or they can't figure out how to do something. You're still getting calls. So you can never turn it off as a general manager of a restaurant. Now, please let me just say this. This is a PSA. Please respect your hospitality workers. In everything that I've worked in my life, no one works harder than people in hospitality, particularly the management, because you can never turn it off. 
an off day is never truly an off day because you're still thinking about the store. Is my DM going to pop in? Are we going to have a bad review or, you know, a bad walkthrough? Am I going to get called in? Am I on an off day because the store is dirty? You can never turn it off. And so you're just stressed, which again impacts family because it's hard to turn that off when you're back home. So yeah, you're right. I It was a had to make a change moment. As someone who worked in customer service and as I had roommates who worked in hospitality, um, it, it's, it's, it's tough also because everyone's very, very replaceable. Everyone. That's right. A everyone. Right. And, and because of that, that means the competition is even higher. Either I would argue even compared to tech, because the question is who's willing to take lesser money for the same role that you want. Um, That's right. Right. So, and so, all right, now it comes to that transition that's into tech. While working, let's just say 60 minimum hours a week, minimum, that's for sure, if you're a manager in hospitality business, it took you two years to get into tech, two plus years. That means after hours, oh no, not after hours, before work, right? Or whenever you have spare time, on top of being exhausted, you have to put that two years of sacrifice into learning how to code, right? That means you have to sacrifice time with your family before the... For, because you need to look far ahead rather than what's going on right now, right? Less time with your family and <laughs> less even pro probably even less sleep, unfortunately, right? How was that process? How was that? That must have been hell. That must have been really difficult. It just wasn't fun at all. And I could not be where I am without the support of my family to be able to say, are we willing to go? And particularly my wife, my wife, Joy, to say, are you willing to go on this ride with me? You know, here's what it's going to be like. You know, this is what the situation is going to be like. Here's where I'm available. Here's where I'm not available. Um, at the time, we were living in a town, uh, not, not a town. This was a two-story house in Oxford. And I said, hey, when I go up to the loft, that's coding time. Oxford is kind of northeast Mississippi, kind of, sort of. Um, where Ole Miss is, University of Mississippi. I opened the athletic dining facility there. It's called the Grill at 1810. It's pretty nice. But whenever I go upstairs, that was like signal, like this coding time. Like, you know, please don't bother me unless it's an emergency. Text me because I need to kind of zone in. Because, you know, you don't just pop up your computer and just instantly you're just coding. Like, you have to kind of get in the zone, particularly if you're just getting off work and your mind's still dealing with the angry customer and the person who quit and you're short-staffed and you got all this stuff. You have to turn all that off and get into coding mode. So I'll be like, please, let's go on this journey together. And it wasn't fun. There was nothing glamorous about it. There's, there's very little about the journey to get into tech that looks like a tech lifestyle. This, this, it's just not fun. You, nobody's Instagramming it. Nobody's putting it on YouTube. You know, the, the red eyes, the frustration. You know, I still don't understand recursion after all these weeks or, you know, I'm trying to learn data structures or algorithms or whatever it is. People don't put that on. And I really wish more people would because it's part of the process and it's a necessary part of the process. So what was it like, Chris? It just wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. But I would do it again because I see where it brought me. And I'm not done yet. Right. That's which is the awesome part. I'm sure we did that later. But I see where it brought me. I see the difference it made in my life and now I can make for my family. And even like this past Sunday, I mentioned church earlier, being able to you know, make a nice donation to some things we're doing at church. I never had that flexibility just to ah, just write the check. Like that's new. Like <laughs> this is a new scenario for me. So, but the process to get here, not fun, not fun. And like I said, I quit. I quit. I wholeheartedly quit. You can even look at my GitHub at least two or three times. Like I'd be going through free code camp or something or going through some other obscure course that wasn't reviewed because, you know, one thing that we have now so much is a huge beginner friendly community and supportive community that didn't exist so much. Like no, seven years nothing. ago, you were just kind of out on your own figuring stuff out. And, um, and I wouldn't know where to turn. I found out about meetups after a while. There were no meetups in my area. Well, there was one, but it was only for college students. You had to be a college student or a professor. I was neither. Um, ended up driving like hours away to Arkansas to go to my first meetup, which made a huge difference and ended up going to one in Memphis too. But there wasn't a whole lot of support. So it was just like you and the tutorial, the book, my little crappy laptop, and just banging away, banging away, like chopping this giant tree and just waiting after two years for it to finally fall. That's the best equivalent. Imagine chopping a tree for two years. The single, the single tree, and the tree is called First Job in Tech. Sometimes it's not like you're making progress and sometimes it seems like you're in the same spot. And God forbid, you know, most of the advice I give is things that I did wrong. God forbid you look away from it for like a week and then come back. You've forgotten everything. 
Because it's not like I'm working in tech. I'm still flipping burgers and, you know, handling customer complaints and stuff like that and hiring and firing people. So my brain isn't oriented to tech at all. So you go away from it for a week and come back to the tutorial, it's, it's all gone. Um, but it's a part of the process. It's a part of the process that I went through and that anyone else can go through, provided, again, back to the first point, you're willing to put in that work because the rewards are great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's life-changing. Now, talking about, so you started the transition, right? Two plus years transition and at, when you were 44 years old. Um, as someone who's working in the hospitality industry, why do you think so many people remain in the hospitality industry for so long? And, and I mean, and so what I mean is, I mean, it's hard as, as hell, as you mentioned, but why do you think so many people don't try to transition away from it, despite everyone who works in the industry knows you can lose your job anytime. It, same thing with tech, but we can find a job anytime, right? But you can lose your job anytime, you're replaceable, and you're treated not so well by customers, by management, underpaid, too many hours, right? Why do you think so many people don't try to leave it and just remain there the rest of their career? Probably two reasons, and this is just going on experience, thinking about the employees that I've had, and even employees that I've talked to after I got out of, out of restaurant industry and into this, and just kind of see where their head is. Typically, it's two reasons. One, there are people who actually enjoy it and are skilled in it. And, and I've worked, I've had the fortune of working with some fantastic chefs for sure. Um, chef Jenny Komar, who was our chef down in Ole Miss, uh, Chef Godfrey Morgan, Jamaican chef down in Jackson, Mississippi, just top notch. Amazing food. Like they were made for that. So there are skilled people in hospitality who enjoy what they do and they probably will do that for the rest of their career. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a second segment of people who are just doing it because it's something to do, which is what my case was. It was just something to do. Eventually it paid enough to take care of my family so I didn't leave. And they've never considered the fact that they have what it takes to make it in anything else. They never gave themselves the chance. And often they just don't have examples, which is, again, why I had to give you the big thanks, uh, the thank you at the beginning to say, hey, I didn't go to college and get all these fancy degrees and I did it. I made it. That's that's a great example. But many of them have never seen a Christian or a me or anyone else to even believe like, you know, I can do something completely different and I have the capability to learn this. Like if you can learn, you know, the basics of <laughs> arithmetic and writing and you know basic science, you can learn enough code to be dangerous. You may not be the next AI engineer writing, you know, something with LNM models, but you can learn enough to be dangerous and get a start. And even if not in programming in some other discipline in tech. Um, but the reason, the second reason, that second set of people just often have never given themselves a chance because they don't think it's possible. And so that's why even now, like I say, five years in, I've been asked, why don't you make more mid-level content or senior content? It's because my heart is for the beginner. And even in my interview with my current job, I was like, you know, I want to make content for the job, which is for, you know, all developers, all the way up to CTO. But in my personal time, I always will have a heart for the beginner, for the person who's either afraid to try or never even thought about it, or even worse, they see tech people as different from them. I run into that a lot. Like there's tech people and then there's little old me. And I try to encourage them. There's literally no difference. They just have different experiences and different things that they learn that if you're willing you can learn them too. You have to be willing. Now, it's not going to be an easy road. I don't have any um, shortcut, you know, three months to tech, like I know your story was. And I'm so glad you were so transparent about, you know what, somebody just gave me a chance because that can happen. And it's good. That to was know literally it. Network. I wasn't good enough for the job either. Yeah. I knew, I I, knew I'm like so thankful nothing. for you saying that. Yeah. And I try to get them to know, but, you know, but it did happen, which means it could happen for them. Get your networking up, meet some people in tech and along the way, learn this stuff. You can learn this stuff. If you don't want to code, let's put you over here. Let's look at, you know, support engineer. Let's look at being a, a business analyst. Let's be being a scrum master. Let's look at some role. But if you want to do something else, it is possible. There's nothing about you inherently incapable of learning. So we just talked about why so many people could be afraid. They don't think it can really happen to them. And so now that allows me to transition to what convinced you that you can make this change in your 40s? Because to be honest, how many people can become a dev not just early 40s, but mid to late 40s. Oh, man, get on Reddit. You, you know, 35, you're you're old. You have to retire, you know, because everyone is in Fang and everyone goes in there. They're 22. Blind. <laughs> they work 10 years and they're done. You know what? My comparison is to see what the possibilities are, not to see what my limitations are. Because people talk about comparing all the time. It's good to compare. It's not good to compare. People have different opinions. It's good to compare yourself when it, to see what the possibilities are, but not what your limitations are. 
And so when I look around and when I don't see any other examples, I'm like, well, I'll be a trailblazer in this. You know, I'll be the first. And there's firsts of all sorts. I can't let the fact that it hasn't happened, let it not happen for me. And so that was an important thing. Uh, my parents being people who, like I said, my dad graduated with his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering later in life. My mom got her bachelor's in her 50s later in life. I had up close examples that you can get your brain to still function and function at a high level at 30s and 40s and 50s. It actually can happen. It's about how much you engage it. So I had that as an example. Um, the fact that I originally was destined to come here. <laughs> like I'm like 30 years later from when I would have graduated from school the first time, but I was always destined to come here. And I do enjoy math and science and nerdy things and geeky things. I mean, my nickname in high school was Dren, D-R-E-N, backwards nerd, backwards nerd. Because I was that guy, the science fair guy, the band guy, the math guy. I was that guy. I just lost it along the way. So I knew somewhere in here it was still there. And then last but not least, one thing that did help. So the Ole Miss job I brought up, I was actually terminated from there. And part of my termination package, I got connected with a career services company called Lee Hecht Harrison, who had me fill out like so many forms. Oh, my God, Chris, it was like worse than the ACT, just so many tests. But one of the tests was like, you know, here's some possible careers that you may excel in based on how you did in this test, just answering all kinds of questions. And the first one was actuarial science. I'm like, what the heck is that? So I had to go Google it. It was like the science of insurance. So like, no. And the second one said web developer. And the third one said computer scientist. It was like two or three tech roles that it, according to this little survey or this document, it said I could still be good in. It was accurate. Really? <laughs> really? Me? And so I tried it. And I tried it. And um, I remember there was something called cloud cloud nine and i think i tried to learn ruby the first time that was like late that was like december 2015 and that was an epic fail because they started like midway in the language and just ran from there i had no idea what was going on so that's, that was my first quit and i started back in like january or february 2016 tried again like i said ran into some issues because you know you do html css if you're going on the front end route and then you come to your first Turing complete true programming language javascript and it's different. Like, once you get beyond just manipulating the DOM, like, you can actually code in JavaScript. It's different. And I didn't have a computer science background, so that was a stopping point. But that was a big indicator that helped me say that, yes, this is possible for me. Having those examples in my parents, people like you, my background, and then also the assessment that I took that said, you can still make it here. And I totally wasn't expecting that. I was surprised, literally shocked. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so amazing. You know, you, you lose your job. You see your severance and then you see, Hey, I can potentially become a web developer and you're a web developer much more now, <laughs> much more. And so it, it's so amazing to see how you, that transition just started about, but I'm curious now that you're in tech, right? You took a pay cut to get your first job, which is funny because the job you had before tech is what junior developers around what junior developers make in tech, right? So you had to go even below that. Depending on geography, depending on yeah, geography, depending on where you live, et cetera. Yeah, in the, yeah. I'm not sure how familiar you are with salaries in Alabama, Mississippi. It's different. Louisiana. I mean, I, I've looked. I've looked at salaries everywhere. Um, I look at salaries everywhere. All, all the people I've met for mentorships on one on one, and so, and to now be in tech, right? And to and your title now is developer advocate. That's correct. Developer okay. advocate at Vaadin. V A A D I N. Vaadin. Gotta throw that plug in there. Yes, yes. We'll get there in a second. But you're a software engineer at <laughs> you're a software engineer at FedEx. So, how was that change in your life? I'm not saying okay, you were living like a baller, right? You weren't. Uh, I don't think so. But like from you know, rest uh, the hospitality business to now working your second tech job, right? You were at FedEx for four years. How much of a difference does that make in your life? right to now you can spend more time with your family now you get paid time off right now you get amazing health insurance especially at fedex one of the best right Great, how has nice. your life and your family's life or like how was that with your even your wife right how has that changed yeah tremendously chris and yeah so yeah i'm in a third tech job now again friends first then fedex and now vaden and the the most immediate change that I can recognize was being treated like an adult. You know, even as a manager, when you're in service industries, hospitality industries, 
you're not treated like an adult, but you're tricked into thinking you are being treated like an adult. And you don't, if you don't have any experience anywhere else, you don't know any better. I remember the first team lunch we went on at FedEx. I think we went to a Mexican, no, we went to an Indian place uh, that we all loved and they all loved. I was new. And long story short, we go there and, um, you know, it's maybe 12, 12, 15 or so, normal lunchtime. And we all order and we're eating and, you know, kids kind of enjoying ourselves. And, you know, lunch is basically an hour. And so it was like 50, 55 minutes. And I'm starting to look at my watch. I'm like, you know, lunch is about over. You know, nobody's moving. And then it's an hour. There's an hour and 10 minutes. And I'm getting antsy, like, you know, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> but I'm having to calm down because our manager's there. Our manager's there. We were at lunch for easily an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes. And I realized you're not in that old environment. I remember, I remember Chris sitting down as a general manager of cookout restaurant in Oxford, trying to just grab a little thing of fries. It wasn't even a true lunch break, just grabbing some fries. And the DM's like, oh, y'all must be slow right now. Bro, I can't eat fries. Like... I remember being on the line. I had a young man. He was like 16, 17. First job ever. He's nervous. He's, you know, he's nervous to even touch the fryer. Like, just never been in any kind of restaurant before. But we hired him. And so I'm trying to just make him comfortable. So I'm on there on the line. We're on there together. I'm trying to make him comfortable. So I'm just cracking little jokes. I'm a dad, so I'm cracking my little dad jokes. I hear the DM in the background. Oh, we're just not serious today, huh? Oh, that's frustrating. I'm a grown man, Chris. You know what I want to say, but I'm a grown man. I can't laugh. I can't eat. It's scrutiny. And so to go from that kind of environment to an environment where you are trusted to do the right thing. Well, you have to do the right thing or you you will you can be terminated too. But you're trusted to do the right thing. You're treated as an adult initially. That is the biggest. I literally just made a TikTok about that this morning. Today, I had a ton of errands to run. A ton of errands to run. And so I got on Slack. I was like, hey, boss, I have a ton of errands to run. So I'm going to work from like 12 to 8. So I'm going to work like a late shift. I'm still getting my eight hours ready. I'm going to start late today. I was like, all right, cool. I'm, I have a comfort. I mean, I have a meetup I'm going to. Talk to you later. And that was it. That never would have happened in my past, ever. I would be struggling trying to figure out how early can I get up? Can I get my wife to take off for a little? I would be struggling trying to get things done. I had to get my license. I had to go print some documents because we don't have a printer for whatever dumb reasons. So I had to go to the library, but I had stuff to do. In tech, okay, handle your business. So for me, that above and beyond, like just salary means the world to be an adult and to be treated like an adult, to be treated with trust first. I trust you're going to do the right thing. Here's the thing. Go do the thing. I don't have to micromanage you. I don't have to stand over you. I don't have to treat you like you're 10. I'm trusting you to go do the job. Here's the description. Here's the objectives. Here's the parameters. Go do the job. Then you leave me to go do what I need to do. That is the best feeling in the world. Then you add on top of that, okay, I have time, which even now, I've continued to learn and to grow because the easiest way to age yourself out in tech is to stop learning. So I still learn and grow. I still have some late nights sometimes, but it's nothing like it was before. It is nothing like just being so physically exhausted from being on my feet for 10, 12 hours that I'm useless for my family. I am useful and it can do the homework and I can have fun family nights and I cook more now and I, you know, I'm more engaged. So they all get to benefit from that more. Fortunately, out of my three kids, only one is left home to enjoy all that uh, but she is enjoying it you know of course she she thinks it's normal like i'm supposed to pick her up from bad practice and take her to school when she has i'm supposed to do those things and cook breakfast every morning but it gives me the flexibility to be there and to be present is a gift that there's there's no amount of money that could, could to, that can compare to that that first thing that you brought up about respect that was the first thing i noticed right not my first tech job though <laughs> But my second tech job, right? And then my third and fourth and fifth, jeez. And I've been in tech for seven years. But. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you started right when I started learning. That's what I'm saying. We were, we've been right there together. I'm just two years behind you. <laughs> that's, that's still mind boggling when I think about it. But um, the, the respect you get in tech, depending on the company, the work-life balance, I can request vacation whenever I want. Just put it on my calendar. That depends on company too, right? Uh, you know, I need to go out for the first half of the day. Oh, my dog got sick and you take her to the vet. I still get paid for that day anyway. Right. Those small things that I think when you work in tech 
for five plus or 10 years, you kind of forget how easy we got it. It's not, our jobs aren't easy, but the benefits that come with it. Most it, of the world does not live like this. No, not even doctors, mm-hmm. right? Uh, not even yeah, doctors. It yeah, it's it's not normal unless you're in tech. But even in tech, you know, I, mean, I would, you know, it's unless you're a software engineer, it's not really that normal, right? Depending on the company. So now that you're in tech, right? I'm really curious to hear about, okay, learning how to code in your 40s though, right? Because some people might think, actually I spoke with someone who's a senior software engineer at Amazon and this person said, dude, I just can't code the way I used to anymore. Like I'm, I'm, my mind is slower, right? I'm not saying that's you, but I mean, that's what this person said. Even for me, I can't focus like I used to when I was in my early 20s, right? I'm 30, turning 36 now, damn, right? Turning 36 now. Remember and so, your age, yeah. <laughs> yes, yo, I, I always forget my age. I always ask my fiance, hold on, hold on. I always ask her. Right? Get so, <laughs> how was that for you, though? Right? What, what were some? And so, what I would, what, what I, what I want to hear is, what were, what was difficult for you, learning how to code, right? And I'm not talking about okay, the work life balance while having a full time job, right? But aside from that, just the co- the learning how to code part. Yeah, man, everything. <laughs> like you know, when you talk about cognitive decline, that's just a basic scientific principle. Everything about the body goes into a decline at certain points. And so you don't take that as a negative. You take that as a signal. It's kind of like the way I deal with imposter syndrome. I'm going to come back to your question. Say when I deal with quote unquote imposter syndrome, you know, sometimes there's behaviors that are happening that we call imposter syndrome that are not. For instance, if you were to say, hey, Lawrence, let me see you. Um, Java 21 just came out today. Let me see you write the best example of using virtual threads. I could say I have imposter syndrome about that. But the fact is, I just don't know how to do it. And I can use that as a signal to say, this is something I can learn. I can put time in. I can practice. I can come back to it later. It might not make sense, but eventually I will grasp this thing. So there's no need for me to be intimidated about it or think it's just going to be impossible. It might take me longer because it's not something I'm familiar with or age or whatever other number of factors, because we all have factors, right? Whenever I deal with people, well, I'm this and I'm that, okay? I respect that. And are you willing to do what it takes to get to where you want to go? Well, like my mentor, James Quick said, and I love this, sometimes you have to be able to push yourself to do the thing you don't want to do in order to get where you want to be. And that was definitely the case for me learning to code. Everything, you asked me what part... Everything was hard. Every concept, especially when I got to JavaScript, that was hard. Then trying to make my own project from scratch, that was hard because I did so much just watching the tutorial and coding. And so when I'm like on a Twitter space or I make a TikTok that says, hey, instead of just watching the tutorial and coding, watch it, code it, and then turn the tutorial off and make sure you can do it in a blank editor. It took me like a year and a half to figure that out because I had never done it and couldn't figure out why I couldn't retain anything. I don't have a bad memory. Like, why can't I retain? It's because I wasn't retaining anything. I wasn't doing anything to retain it. I was just, all right, next you're going to type script. Okay, script. I would just type along. That's not learning, right? That's like monkey see, monkey do. The learning part is after you've done that to turn the tutorial off and see how much did I remember. So if it's some new concept, you just learned how to do a switch statement. After you learn it for the first time and you code along with the tutorial, then you have to go back and code it on your on your own. If you can do it all, great. If you can't, Wherever you get stuck, that's where you go back to tutorial and learn just that part again. Then you go back to your blank editor, make sure you can do it. I did not do that at first. So I'm still on your question, what was hard? The hard part was just retaining and figuring out what do I need to do in order to retain this material so I can reproduce it on a job, so I can convince some job somewhere to trust me with their code, which is the biggest hurdle, especially now that many self-taught developers are facing, is getting a professional enterprise to trust you to work on their code. As much as you're not a CS degree graduate, I did get my degree, but it wasn't in CS. It was like general business, and it was years, years later. It had nothing to do with tech at all. The fact of the matter is, right, right or wrong, many companies still look at that CS degree as kind of a, a barometer. Like, this is our scale. This is what we're looking for. And so in this competitive environment where there's so many layoffs and job shrinkage and everything else and a plethora of self-taught developers – they're in the mix of that competition. So you have to figure out how do I make myself stand out? And you're going to have to just go deeper. And I had to go deeper. So what was hard about it? 
Everything, absolutely everything. And I, you know, I would take vitamins, supplements. I was on Alpha Brain, anything I could think of. Alpha you know, Brain. I was for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anything I could think of to improve, I started exercising better because that helps with blood flow and blood flow to the brain. So important. Anything you could think to do to improve cognitive performance, I had to do those things. I can't just say, oh, well, I'm 40. My brain has worked like I'm 20. Woe is me. That won't get you anywhere. And we all have a woe is me story. Some of us have multiple woe is me stories. The question is, what is there that can be done about it? That's the only question. And for virtually everyone I've ever encountered, from the numerous people I mentored one-on-one, there's always something you can do. The question is, and this is repetitive at this point, are you willing to do it? How, and how far are you willing to go? Well, there's too many people. All right, well, what are you willing to do? How far are you willing to specialize? How deep can you get? You know, JavaScript. Is that the most popular language being hired for in your community? Or in your city, right? You want remote? Maybe you need to think more in person for your first job. And I talk about this in my TikTok too. I'm just, rec- I'm just recounting my TikTok, but it's how far you're willing to go. And I was willing to do whatever it takes. You know, I was kind of like, you know, the guy. Uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, David Goggins. When you want it as much as you want to breathe when you're underwater, that's that's the point where things start clicking, and you'll yeah. go the extra mile. And I definitely had that level of thirst. Damn. Wow, I was not expecting that much of a, that, that detail of answer, and, and it's so true, especially, and, and I want to bring up the part where uh, you talked about how some people think it's imposter syndrome when it's really you need to understand that, no, it's just you really don't know that subject and you just have to put the time to learn. And I, I, I think that people think they can't code because they can't retain, but it's not that they can't retain it, it's just it's literally putting the time in to better understand a subject or a topic or a language so that you could retain it. But the mistake that so many people make is depending on not documentation, not blog posts, I would say that's totally fine. Video tutorials where it's you watch what they do. You literally type it, which is literally copy and pasting, although you're just typing it out and you're not going to retain anything. Right. And and it, it, and that's me though, especially with me, I had dyslexia and I say this is literally every single video because I'm so proud of it. But that was me too. And so now, like, I'm learning how to build something with Astro 3.0, and I haven't done HTML, CSS, JavaScript in three years. Zero video tutorials, all documentation, all Google, a little bit of chat GPT here because I don't remember all my JavaScript anymore. And that's it. But I'm learning fast compared to video tutorials. And that's actually why I'm, I'm working my own tutorial because I noticed that with all these people who create so many tutorials, their goal is to keep you, like, dep- they want you to depend on them where every tutorial they create, you buy tutorial after tutorial. And I don't blame that because that's how they make the living. And so what I'm doing is I'm working on my own tutorial plug. (laughs) This is a plug, but I'm working on my own tutorial, but the goal is, (laughs) yeah, but but the goal is, and it's also an HTML, CSS and a JavaScript course, but the goal is to teach you how to no longer need a tutorial anymore after that. Mm. Once you learn HTML, CSS, you never need to use a HTML, CSS tutorial again. Same thing with JavaScript. The goal is to help you no longer depend on this stuff so you can actually succeed in your career. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people give up because they're only like, you know what I mean? Like, like you said, only they're not, they're not trying to retain it by building something after they watch it. They just built it while watching and then they move on to the next thing. Man, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Chris, and to, to hear you say as a self-taught dev, a person who didn't do the college route, that you're relying primarily on documentation. That's just, man, I'm so glad. Do you realize how many people I argue with, argue with that? I don't read. I'm just doing videos. I don't like reading. And I'm like, I understand that and respect that. But please understand, there's a certain type of learning that happens when you read that doesn't happen in any other way. There's nothing that can replace reading. And once you get on the job, it's all documentation because there's not going to be videos for all that for all that source code. There's docs. Hopefully, there's docs. And if you're the new person to this new docs, you'll probably have to write docs. Now, how are you going to write documentation and you don't read documentation? There's a certain type of learning that happens retention-wise, back to your original question, with reading that doesn't happen with anything else. And so even dealing with, like you said, cognitive decline, I'm always reading something. So I just started... For the third time, uh, Mary Thingvall's book, The Value of Developer Relations, uh, which is like third the Bible. Damn. I kept starting it and stopping it, starting it, stopping it, but I'm in it for real because I got the job now, so it matters. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, reading, reading keeps you, it keeps you sharp, but it keeps certain certain gears going in a good way, and it helps you communicate as well. Um, and I remember that from like grade school. All leaders are readers, so mm-hmm. it's stuck. 
I, I want to double down on that on, on reading. I hate reading. I, I bought this book called Outlive because I want to go to my 90s, hopefully reach my 90s. It's how to longevity book on how to live longer, right? What you need to do now so you can, you know, not be weak as hell in your 90s or 80s, right? And so I tried reading it. I couldn't do it. I just bought the audiobook. And I, I just listen to the audiobook when I'm exercising, going on the three mile walks every morning. But I hate like I hate reading because of dyslexia. And but when I code, when I read documentation, I have to read. Right. When I'm learning new technology, I have to read the documentation, I have to Google and do all this stuff. But reading is so hard for me uh, to the point that when I, I'm looking at your LinkedIn right now, right, and I'm looking at the text now, all I see are scribbly lines. It's that hard for me to read to the point that when I'm reading, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at this text right now on my screen and the words are blurring out. So what I did to help me with that, and I only learned about this um, last year, there's this font for dyslexia called uh, dyslexia something, open dyslexic. Open Dyslexic, which is a, a special font? font. Yeah, it's a font, a plugin, yeah, a Chrome, a Chrome pl plugin. Yeah, it's a Chrome plugin called Open Dyslexic, so it's easier for me to read now. And so now when I'm reading through documentation, it's easier for me to retain what I read, rather than trying to read something three or four times. That's how that's how you know that's how slow I am when it comes to learning. And so I have to put that extra effort. But even for me, it's no excuse. I have to. And if you want to read it, you, you but have you, to. You, back to my point though, you did the thing. You acknowledge where you are, and you figure out okay. So what is the solution to it? There, there's a difference in acknowledging a situation going on in your life and saying, well, that's going to limit me. I'm done. Mm -hmm. And saying, hey, here is an issue. It's a signal that I need to do some other things. It may not be what anyone else has to do. That doesn't matter. I have to figure out for me. Lawrence has to figure out for Lawrence. Chris has to figure out for Chris. What do I need to do to get to where I want to go? If reading is going to be an important part of my discovery process, I have dyslexia. All right, what are some solutions? Let me try one. Let me try another. Let me keep trying things until I find something that works for me. That's where you make it personal. So shout out to you. You're doing the thing. I mean, that, that's what it takes. That's what we all need to do. So now I want to go into your transition. For, oh, you left tech, not, sorry, not tech. You left the role of a software engineer now. To and they call it full stack developer, just to be clear. Yeah. Oh, I, I, sorry, full at stack FedEx. developer they at FedEx. Call it, call it full stack developer. We did a stack of uh, Java, Spring Boot, uh, MySQL, Damn. Angular. Java. Oh. Yeah. I'm a Java guy. You didn't know that? SQL. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Your Java, Java guy. guy. I, the, you your know the, I do you know up. the one language I hate? Which one? Java? Mm-hmm. Because it was the first one I tried to learn when trying to get my first job, and I gave up for three months, and then I went to front end. <laughs> and one so, of the main features that was released in Java today, because today is Java Day, Java 21, was something specifically geared towards early learners to make Java easier to learn. Mm. Yep. Damn, seven years later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I appreciate what? that, Java. <laughs> Hence why I hate it. No, I just I just had a bad experience with it and never tried to learn it again. Okay, so, so you were a full stack developer at FedEx. You left a very technical role for a not as technical, right, dev role, meaning you don't push or, or like meaning, and I'm assuming that means you don't push, you don't write anything to push anything to production anymore, or do you? Mm, so I haven't, but I'm pretty sure all three of my dev roles have. Oh, so wow. This company is different. I work for a company, like I said, it's called Vaden. It is an engineering focused and centered organization with some very talented people who are loyal and believe in that company, believe in our products. Many of them have been there five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years coding away. Um, I know Monty for sure, he was working on production code shortly before I joined the team and he's a DevRel. Um, so they code and I've probably just on the personal project I've been working on for the last couple of weeks, I've probably coded more Java here than I did as Dev in my last month at FedEx because wow. we're working on some migrations, doing some stuff with cloud and stuff, which was not so much Java. So this is an engineering focused organization very much. Um, and you, you have to know the code deeply enough, not just to be able to like sell it, but to talk about the intimate features and be able to display the code in your projects and in samples and in code snippets. And no, we're not doing production code all the time. That's not our job, but they all have the capability to do so. So this is a different type of shop, and there's not many out there that I've noticed like this. Uh, my whole DevRel list was very, very short. I think you, I may have talked to you a little bit about it. There's not like a ton of places. I've only interviewed probably once every six months for the last year and a half. So this was a cycle. Uh, six months ago, there was a cycle with another company. I'll say it, it was Vonage. 
Um, six months before that, there was a cycle with GitHub and all, always just single companies. It wasn't like I'm just trying to work anywhere. I had single companies that I researched deeply. I researched the team, the manager, what they do. I would find their YouTube, their Twitter, see what their tone was. I cannot see myself and I will only go for that one company. And six months before that was New Relic. <laughs> Believe it or not. Because yes, I was still following you. As, as soon as you left New Relic, I was on their job board every day. <laughs> so I know that they, uh, they have some job in their ecosystem. And I'm talking to yeah. Jeremiah Suss later on and just that and the other. But that job ended up just kind of closing up. A lot of people left that I job. Tried. I'll tell you that. A lot of people left that team. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the lot. stories that can be told. Yes, yes. Wow. Okay. So that's that, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that it is still a very technical role because – I don't know if I said this to you or if I said this earlier, but my experience in DevRel, my jobs haven't been as technical, right? And in results where it's really full out content and it hurts me, right? It hurts me in my career and it just hurts me in my brain in a way because I am very happy when I build things with code, not just content, right? That's why I do my YouTube channel. I don't have to code on it, uh, but I don't want to do that for work too. And so... I'm very happy. That's a, that was a that's a great decision of you, by the way, to do that. Now, talking about the switch to Devrel, then, why did you do it? Right? Yeah, Take because it from and again, I have three years of experience in this role already, and and yes, like the roles I've the offers I've received make more than senior software engineer roles I've seen in other places too. But on, in the long run, as a software engineer, you can definitely make much more down the line than the dev world, right? So I'm just thinking of it from a money perspective, right? Income perspective. So why? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, great question. So I could have easily gone either track. And honestly, even with the leadership experience I have, I could easily have gone into a management track as well. Very, very easily because I'm very comfortable and feel fulfilled when I'm leading a team to a win. Um, very fulfilled. Like I enjoyed that. That was the one part of the restaurant business that I enjoyed leading a team, like being a coach. I was more like coach Lawrence than like manager Lawrence. That's fun for me having a team. So I could have easily gone to manager track, stayed on a software engineer track or go to DevRel. But DevRel for me made a lot of sense because it combined again, my love for code and tech in general with helping others. So the beginning of my tech journey, the very first tech job, Fred's, a lot of that had to do with my association with a group called Code Connector. It's a tech meetup group, basically based out of Memphis, but not really. We have people that join from oh, all Danny over. Danny Thompson and James Quick, if it's in Memphis. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. All of those guys. Um, James was one of the OG mentors that I met my very first meetup. Uh, Danny came like some months later, but I was poured into and you have a Christian background, you know what that means. I was poured into by people who just wanted to see me win, who just, they didn't want anything from me. They weren't selling anything. They just wanted to help me win. James Quick and Joe Ferguson of PHP fame and Ted Patterson, the design master. So many people here in the Memphis area just poured into me that once I got that first job in tech, which was at Fred's, uh, shout out to Blake, uh, Blake, Blake Franklin, I think. Um, I said, I have to do this to somebody else. I have to help others. Like, I can't just, you know, okay, they got me in and that's just it. Who else can I bring along, especially from people coming from underrepresented groups, especially people coming from industries where they don't think they're even capable or they think tech people are something different than they are and they're not. Who else can I bring along? So it was very shortly after I got in tech that I was giving back, that I was mentoring, that I was helping in the um, in the meetups, whether it was just go grab the pizza or arrange the chairs, anything I could do to help. You know, I was there. And that grew to actually leading Code Connector, the organization, being the community manager for them starting two or three years ago, give or take, and uh, really kind of organizing a national board, kind of giving out duties of thing, again, playing my coach, Coach Lawrence role, making work sure we were more organized and sustainable. Um, and really, really happy with the volunteers that we have. Just some great people. I'm not going to try to name them all. Great, great people. You can join us at CodeConnector.io. We have a Slack invite there, but awesome volunteers. And so once that was going good, then it was, I was on Instagram. I started making tech content on Instagram and people were getting in my DMs like, well, how do I get started? And, and how do I do this? And how, like just tons of questions, which led me to start doing content on TikTok. Sometimes code related, usually more so career related. Be, I was thinking though, 
I'm asked the same questions repeatedly. Why don't I answer it one time in a video? And it's just there. Like it's always there. You can always access it. So that's why I got on TikTok in the first place. It wasn't to blow up or to be, you know, anything other than a resource to answer these questions. So it was Instagram, then TikTok, and then on Twitter, I learned, hey, there's an entire community. We colloquially call it Tech Twitter, but there's a whole group of folks that meet on a regular basis and converse about things tech. Now, sometimes it's a bunch of BS, be honest, because people just be talking out the side of their neck with no knowledge, no interest. They just want you to click on their post. But aside from that, there is a thriving community of tech people on Twitter. So like, all right, well, now I've got to go back to Twitter again and start building up content up there. And so now I have these different points where I'm reaching out, reaching out, putting out content, putting out content, putting out content, short videos, short tweets, posts, threads, things of that nature. The next thing I know, I get an opportunity to speak at an online conference, speaking of Danny, he had a conference called Southern Dev Fest. And I put together a talk on the history of JavaScript and it went well, like people liked it. I was like, oh, that felt great. And so some time passed and I think we had, um, what was next? I think it was the Juneteenth conference the next year, which would have been like two years ago. Don't quote me. Uh, Michael Brown from Microsoft, he was on the Juneteenth conference, got an opportunity to speak with them. That went over very well. Like, okay, this speaking thing is working out good. I'm still putting out content. Now I'm speaking. And that was around when I found out, hey, there's actually a job title where you do this for pay. It's called technical evangelism in the past or developer advocacy or developer relations engineer. And that was around at or around the time when I knew you were a dev at New Relic and then you weren't. And so that was, like I said, my first shot there. And then it was more conference talk after that. Um, thanks to Scott Hansman from Microsoft for the invite to Microsoft Build this year. That was my largest conference to date. Just tons of people got to speak on a panel with him about content creation. And then invited by Anthony Mays, uh, formerly of Google, currently with Carrot and Brilliant Black Minds to speak at Render. So I was at a speaker panel with him at Render ATL. Had a great time. That was a great reception. So it just made sense that everything about content and reaching developers and helping developers win, I enjoy. And I also enjoy tech too. So I don't want to just be over here. I have to still be technical. It's the DevRel, but it needs to be a specific type of DevRel where I can still get my hands dirty. And I'm still definitely getting my hands dirty today. Yo, that is, that's amazing. And, and seeing your growth, right? I remember us DMing each other on Discord, right? There was some crazy moderator on my Discord and you, I, I barely checked my Discord. So I oh, yeah. Right. And that's when we kind of started okay. talking, followed each other on TikTok. I'm like, damn, this guy's blowing up on TikTok. What the heck? That's amazing. And now you're Which Twitter. makes like, no sense. Why dude. is the old guy blowing up on TikTok? <laughs> yo, yo, your stuff is good. And to be honest, I, I should be doing, I'm going to start doing it now since I have all the time in the world. Um, and I want to bring this up real quick. I know we're almost out of time, but like I was laid off. Yeah, that was yeah, yeah, it goes by fast. Uh, if you, if you, do you have like 10 more minutes or something? Are you cool? Yeah, you're good. Okay, okay. You're oh, good. yeah, you work in tech. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh what was i talking about oh yeah okay so and so one of the reasons i brought up the concern about devrel is because there are a ton of layoffs happening in devrel but it depends on the companies too right companies here and there right i was laid off for the second time in tech right the uh, last time i was laid off was f four years ago um in tech and uh gosh the job doesn't seem unstable but i think it is depending on the role right and depending on the company but again, I was recently laid off, which to be honest, has been one of the greatest hidden blessings in my life. The first time I was laid off, I got the job at New Relic, right? Going from below six figures to high six figures, just like that. It's insane. It's insane, right? And so I was laid off again. And I'm like, well, yeah, let's, let's see what happens this time. <clears throat> and so I've been waiting for an excuse to do content full time. Like I could have, and, and I've been making more from YouTube than I do tech, but I was looking for an excuse to actually really take that, go all out on that. And so now that I lost my job, uh, fortunately, now this is my life, right? I have enough savings to last me a while, right? And, and, and to be honest, I'm making money every month on YouTube. So that's going to add to my savings every single month. And like, I honestly... Oh, I don't know how if I should say this. I don't know if I'll ever go back to DevRel now after my experience in that. To be honest, it's probably more towards back to engineering if I ever do. Right. If I ever need to go back. And I don't I mean, if I ever go back, it's because I want to, not because I need to. 
right? It'd be more of an engineering role because I do miss coding more than only making content. Because I'm, and I think it's different for me because I make content on my own channels already. A lot of content, all these podcasts. I edit all my videos. I don't use my video editor no more. I edit all my videos and everything. And then to do that for work also, it's just too much. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. It's, it's got to make sense for you, man. It got to make sense. And if you need to bounce any ideas off someone about what you're doing, you know, my man, James Quick. So he did that last year. Yes. You know, and he was at the top of his game. And they just, you know, his job just, hey, you know, we got to get rid of this department or that, whatever. And he was laid off. Yeah. Not for he's, performance he's by a, any means. He, he's a legit, he's a really good developer. He's really good at, I mean, everything. Oh, my gosh. And like, so it can happen to anyone. Yeah, so he, yeah, it's, but the thing is, he said, "Hey, I'm going to work for myself and see how this works." And he had a certain like income goal and time goal he wanted to meet. He made it. Three months later, he met that one and that one. So it's been over a year now, and he hasn't gone back. So if you need to That's vibe impressive. with someone who's doing full time content creation, doing it successfully, and enjoying the process, being home for the birth and support of his, of his baby and his wife, huge, all of that, because it's his own time. You craft your own time, but still so going to conferences and making a difference. Talk to James. But yeah, for, yeah he, he's for next. Sure. Several in general, it's got to make sense. And like I said, each time that I've gone for this, I did a lot of time looking into the role, the research, the company, uh, the team, the manager, where I could find the, what kind of content put out, what they would be expected to do and make sure it made sense for me because not every company handles it the same. It's a really squishy role. And it's interesting, kind of funny, but kind of not funny to see how many companies really have no idea why they even have a DevRel team in the first place. That's not somewhere you want to work. <laughs> More often than not. Yeah. They think it's, it's just going to bring the sales or it's going to do this or it's going to do that. It's like, no, this is this is literally about the relations. It's in the title. Mm -hmm. So so I found the place for me. <laughs> that's huge. And again, that's number one though. Uh, if you join a company where they don't know what the what they don't know what they want the devil the person to do, or they want the devil person to be sales, marketing, and software engineer. For, for example, for example, okay, I'm leading a hackathon. This is when I was working my last job, leading a hackathon, Hacktoberfest, all 30 days. While I'm in, uh, preparing for it while I'm in Paris and London, right, giving talks at conferences for a week. I'm also doing it while I'm at a retreat for work for that entire week, right? And so for about a month and a half, when I'm not home for four of the six weeks, maybe seven, um, I'm, I'm out traveling and working 70 hours a week. Right. Wow. And so, and you know, and yeah, and that's when people started leaving here and left here, left and right. And so it sucks. And so that's not a role I want again. Right. And so that's kind of like, I prefer engineering more. It's more like, all right, here's these tickets work on that. Right. Um, where in DevRel, it's kind of hard to manage to, it's hard to, from what my experience, or maybe it's because of the people I've worked under, um, it's hard to determine what, how, how to determine what's successful or not in DevRel. It's very, very difficult. And so when you find a company, like you're mentioning, that knows what they're doing, go for it. Huge. Yeah, that was one of my first questions. When you get to ask the question in the interview, I'm like, so how do we determine success for a developer advocate in Vodden? <laughs> like, what are the metrics we're looking for? And he was able to give it to me. It wasn't like a, oh, uh, you know, no, he was able to give it to me. Here's what we're looking for. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, all right, that's, that's targets. I understand that. I like yeah. numbers. I like metrics. I like it when things can add up. So that was a big deal to me. And that's similar reason why I could never be, never have been like the first, because there was a number of positions, even a company that reached out to me that I was going to be the first DevRel. Like, no way possible. No way possible. I'm not telling anyone else not to do it, but for me, no way possible. I need to have an established team, and you know why that team exists, and they know why they exist, and those two whys are the same. Mm -hmm. That that has to be in place for me to step in to feel like I can be comfortable, successful, and make a difference. But, oh, yeah, you'd be the first one up and starting. No way possible. Um, that would just be way too much stress. I wasn't the first one. I was number two, but it felt like I was the first one, right? Uh, it, it's not. It's not fun, right? Now I could do it now because I have so much more experience, but it's it's definitely not easy. Lawrence, seriously, want to thank you for being on here. So thank for those invite. who don't happen to know you, uh, where can, I'll put the links to your TikTok, to your Twitter, uh, to everything Lawrence related. Lawrence decodes everywhere. Because Danny picked on me for the longest time. He could never find me on this platform because I had all these aliases. But as of now, Lawrence decodes everywhere. You'll find me. Amazing. Lawrence, again, thank you so much for being on here, man. Man, thank you. This has been awesome, Chris.